Thank you all for joining us for an evening with Peter Thiel. My name is Kimberly Howe, and I'm a junior in Columbia College and a board member of CORE, the Columbia Organization of Rising Entrepreneurs. CORE is Columbia's Student Entrepreneurship Society and is one of the largest and most active organizations at Columbia. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and launch the next wave of Columbia entrepreneurs. To that end, we organize and host workshops, challenges, lectures, and incredible speaker events such as the one you are here for this evening. Before we get started, CORE would like to thank our amazing partners, the Eugene Lang Entrepreneurship Center at Columbia Business School and Columbia Entrepreneurship for their support in making tonight's event possible. With that, I would like to introduce Dave Lerner, the Director of Columbia Entrepreneurship. Please welcome Dave Lerner. Thank you. Thanks, Kimberly. I want to welcome everybody. It's great to see such a massive crowd here to kick off the season at, at Columbia. Uh, it seems like all these great entrepreneurs are kicking off their book tours at Columbia these days, which is a great tradition. I hope we continue. Ben Horowitz launched his uh, book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, a few months ago, and now Peter's here. So we're delighted to host him and delighted, too, to have Shane Snow, uh, a graduate of Columbia's Journalism School, co-founder of Contently, which is a company that's doing really well. And he's also uh, put out a, a book that's doing incredibly well called Smart Cuts, which you'll hear more about today. A few things to say. After uh, the discussion that we're going to have, uh, Peter's books are going to be on sale in the back of the room. There's going to be a book signing in the green room. Um, and I'll just say a couple of other things. Uh, you know, Columbia Entrepreneurship is uh, an effort to harness the massive entrepreneurial energy of the entire Columbia community. It's out of the president's office. Uh, we've had a great year. We're looking forward to another great year. We're really proud of collaborating with five deans to open Columbia's startup lab uh, down on 175 Varick Street. So Columbia is downtown and uptown now, and we have 71 alumni entrepreneurs working on 33 startups down there, so it's incredibly exciting. Um, so listen, I just want to welcome you all. Uh, we're going to have a Global Entrepreneurship Month coming up on October, October 13th to be exact, and you can find out a lot about it by going to entrepreneurship.columbia.edu. So have fun tonight, welcome, and uh, it's great to have you here. Thanks a lot. So I just want to introduce the next speaker. Uh, he's a senior at the School of General Studies. He's the president of CORE, the Columbia Organization of Rising Entrepreneurs. He's an entrepreneur himself, and he has a full-time job somehow. Uh, he's the co-founder of a music distribution startup called Track Ripple. And really, he's just a, a supernova of, of a human being. He's got massive energy. Um, please give a warm Columbia welcome to Andrew Satz. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Um, and thank you, Dave, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I also want to thank the Eugene Lang Center for Entrepreneurship um, and Columbia Entrepreneurship for being absolutely amazing partners in this event. Um, as Dave mentioned, my name is Andrew Satz. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of being the president of Columbia Organization of Rising Entrepreneurs. I'm also a senior in the School of General Studies. For those of you who don't know about the School of General Studies, um, it's the premier undergraduate college for non-traditional students, including veterans, um, artistic performers, and entrepreneurs. Um, so Kimberly introduced you guys to CORE a little bit earlier, um, and so I won't make you wait any longer for Peter by explaining what we do. Um, but um, I do want to talk to you guys about something that amazing that's going on here at Columbia around entrepreneurship. Um, on your seats, you should have received a flyer for the Columbia Launchpad. Um, the Columbia Launchpad is a year's worth of entrepreneurial programming that was designed under an unprecedented partnership between the many schools and organizations here at Columbia University. Um, Columbia Launchpad was designed to allow Columbia affiliates that are anywhere along the entrepreneurship spectrum, whether you want to get into entrepreneurship but you don't even have an idea, all the way to launching your company. Um, along with helping to launch people into entrepreneurship, uh, Launchpad was designed to help students and young alumni um, prepare for the quarter million dollar Columbia Venture competition. 
Um, the quarter million dollar Columbia Venture Competition is an amazing opportunity designed to provide Colombians with the financial support um, to launch their ventures. So uh, please make sure to head to Columbia Launchpad to stay up to uh, columbialaunchpad.com to stay up to date on all the things happening around entrepreneurship and to get involved at the, in Columbia, the Columbia entrepreneurship community. So with all those exciting items mentioned, it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend, the director of the Eugene Lang Center for Entrepreneurship at Columbia Business School, Vincent Ponzo. Good evening, everybody. I promise I am the last person before Peter gets up here on stage. Um, just wanted to take a second to thank Dave Lerner, thank Andrew Satz, um, and really thank everybody here tonight for journeying so far uptown to, uh, to Columbia uh, to hear the amazingly talented, incredibly intelligent Peter Thiel speak to us tonight. Um, as the new director of the Eugene Lang Entrepreneurship Center at Columbia Business School, I have been very, very fortunate to have inherited a legacy of entrepreneurship that spans almost 20 years. Over the course of those many years, the Lang Center has produced entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial thinkers of all types across all geographies and across all industries. Some of those graduates have even received what might be considered the ultimate endorsement, an investment from Peter Thiel's Founders Fund, with the fund making investments in Columbia Business School uh, related companies such as ZocDoc, Newton, and Spotify, all of which have Columbia Business School alumni in critical leadership roles ranging from CEO to CTO to COO. So Peter really doesn't need much of an introduction, but I'm gonna introduce him anyway. Um, Peter Thiel is an entrepreneur and investor. He first gained attention for his attempt to replace the US dollar by starting PayPal, which did not achieve that ultimate goal, but which, cha which did change the way payments work and made it possible for hundreds of thousands of small businesses to thrive on the internet. After taking PayPal public and then selling it to eBay, he has become known as the Don of the PayPal Mafia, since so many of his former colleagues have gone on to start successful companies, including SpaceX, Tesla Motors, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Yelp. In 2004, Peter himself started Palantir Technologies, a data analytics company that makes tools for national security and global finance. That same year, he also made the first outside investment in Facebook, where he continues to serve on the board of directors. Today, as a partner at Founders Fund and in his own investing, he works to identify and support the next generation of technology companies. He also started the Teal Foundation and the 20 Under 20 Teal Fellowship, helping to ignite a debate on the differences that might exist between learning and schooling. Despite his criticism of the education bubble, in spring 2012, Peter taught a class in the computer science department of his alma mater, Stanford University. He has now revised and rewritten that class to make the new book called Zero to One, Notes on Startups or How to Build the Future. So let's all give Peter a warm New York City welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, um, I'm, I'm always, uh, it's always a great privilege to speak uh, um, in front of an um, audience here at, um, at, at Columbia. And I, I want to, uh, there's so many different directions to go in. When I, in, in um, writing uh, Zero to One, um, I wanted to basically, the goal was to teach everything that I've learned about entrepreneurship and, uh, uh, and about technology. Because I think, I think it is critical for us as a society to be building a range of new um, new technology companies in the decades ahead. Um, and one of the challenges that you run into, though, though when you teach entrepreneurship or write about it, um, is that it's, there's something very slippery about the subject. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, there's a sense in which the next uh, Bill Gates won't be starting an operating system, the next uh, Larry Page will not start a search engine, the next Mark Zuckerberg will not start um, a social networking site, and if you're, you know, if you're copying these people, you're in some sense not learning from them. And, uh, and I, th I think that um, all the sort of great moments in innovation, in technology, in business only happen once. Um, and, uh, and so zero to one is sort of a, is, you know, these, is, is about all these sort of singular moments where you build the first airplane or the first home computer, the first iPhone, or you, 
find like a new market like Airbnb does or like eBay did. And, um, and then the question becomes, you know, what can you actually say that's systematic about this stuff at all? If, if, uh, if every single moment has this, uh, has this sort of singular character where um, um, it's, uh, it's different and what's, what's actually really critical is, uh, is what's different. And, um, and that's probably sort of where I, where I start um, this, this book. And I, I, basically, I basically focus on the question of, um, you know, I, I, there's, there's a business version of this question I always like to ask people, which is, uh, what, what great company is nobody starting? Um, and there's a more intellectual version of it that I always like as an interview question, which is, uh, you know, just tell me something that's true that almost nobody agrees with you on. And, um, and this, this, is, uh, this turns out to be, be a shockingly hard interview question for people to answer because uh, they've, been, they've been taught all sorts of things that are understood to be conventionally true. Um, and people are very uncomfortable articulating things that uh, nobody agrees with them on. And it's, it's not just because you have to be smart or have to figure out something new, but um, it's also always in sort of a social context where um, you have to say something, you know, the, the correct answer is one that the person asking the question uh, won't agree with or might not even want to hear. And, uh, and so I think there's always, an, we're living in a world in which um, you know, courage is an even shorter supply than genius. And so, um, um, and, um, and yet I think it is um, answers to these sorts of questions that, uh, that are um, at the core of what all these, uh, all these great businesses um, um, all these great businesses have and how they get started. Um, my, my book is, um, my book Zero to One gives a whole set of uh, contrarian answers to this question. Uh, and I'll, I'll sort of mention um, three major ones, three major themes in my opening remarks today and then uh, it would be great to sort of explore some, uh, some things in more detail in the, in the Q&A. So um, the, the, first, the first really big uh, theme, and this, this runs all the way through 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 the book, um, and you know all the all the contrarian answers are of the form most people believe X and the truth is not X. So um, you know one one broad answer like this is most people believe that uh, capitalism and competition are synonyms, and I believe they are antonyms. I believe that a capitalist is someone who's in the business of accumulating capital. I believe a world of perfect competition is a world where all the capital gets competed away. And so um, if you, um, the, so the restaurant industry in New York City is an extremely competitive industry and it is extremely non-capitalistic. Nobody makes any money. Um, and a, a company like uh, Google is, um, is um, extremely capitalistic. It's made uh, uh, tons of profits for, for a very long time and it's had no real competition in search since about 2002, when it definitively distanced itself from um, Yahoo and from Microsoft, um, the uh, the sort of the um, the sort of attribute that uh, all these sorts of singular zero to one companies have um, goes under the, the sort of rubric of um, that they're monopolies. And I think that uh, and I, I do think that the goal of every entrepreneur, everybody who starts a company should be to, uh, to create and build a, um, a new monopoly. Um, and we can, we can have debates about whether this is good for the outside society. I think in some cases it is. In some cases, it's more debatable. But um, if you want to have a successful company, it should be, it should be a monopoly. And I think this is, a, and this is sort of as a business truth that gets very obscured because, because um, in practice, the, uh, um, the, the people who have monopolies uh, don't talk about it, and they, they pretend not to have them. Um, the people who do not have monopolies, um, on the other hand, uh, don't want to say that they're never going to make any money, and so they pretend to sort of have a little bit of pricing power or a little bit of something that's kind of like a monopoly. And so if the monopolists pretend not to have monopolists and the non-monopoly companies pretend to have monopolies, the apparent difference is much smaller than this real difference. And I, I think it's almost like it's almost like this bimodal distribution. There are basically two kinds of companies. There are monopolies that make money. There are non-monopolies that, um, that do not make um, money. And, and the way, and sort of one of the ways people get at it rhetorically is that uh, if you have a monopoly and you're trying to hide your monopoly, 
you will, um, you will describe your market as being enormously big. Um, and so if you're maybe a very successful search engine company, you will say that you are a technology company and you're competing ferociously on Android phones with Apple and you're competing incredibly hard in social networking and you're building a self-driving car that will compete with uh, all the car companies and there's just competition everywhere because you're in this incredibly big market called technology. Um, and if you were to try to open a restaurant in New York City, you would say that, uh, that um, it's one of a kind, there's no competition at all, it is the only Nepalese British fusion cuisine anywhere in, uh, within a 10 block radius of, uh, of Colombia. Um, and, uh, and so you will define your market as a very, very small market. Um, and, so we, we, and so I think you know, it's, it's always dangerous when people tell themselves these lies um, and, um, and so you need to think really hard about what are, what are the actual markets and um, what are the actual things. But I think the, the, uh, the learning within Silicon Valley is that uh, people don't understand these business things uh, very well at all because they're always distorted in the way in which people talk about them. Now, I think this is not just sort of an intellectual problem where people don't understand this monopoly concept or uh, or they don't understand the competition concept. I also do think um, there are these uh, very powerful sort of psychological things that uh, perversely attract us to competition and uh, turn us away from monopoly. And, uh, and it is because there's always the sense that there is safety in crowds. And so if a lot of people are doing something, then, um, then it's a good idea to do that too, even though um, Unlike uh, Malcolm Gladwell, I, I believe there's no wisdom in crowds. I think, um, I think there's generally only insanity to be found in crowds. Um, and um, and in, in practice, um, what you will find is lots and lots of competition. And, um, and I, you know, I, I, there's sort of our aspects where I've been you know, a big critic of, of parts of the education system. But uh, when, I, when I sort of look back on my, um, you know, my, my, um, you know, my earlier career, um, I, the, you know, the retrospective was that it was super tracked, it was super um, sort of conventionally competitive. In my eighth grade yearbook, one of my friends wrote in that uh, you know, he was certain I'd make it into Stanford as a sophomore in four years, and that sort of happened, and then, you know, it was, um, and then you know, I went to law school, and then I worked at a big law firm in New York for, um, for seven months and three days. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, um, and, and you know, it's, if I had to do it over again, um, I probably would still do, I might still do some of those things, but I, I, I would ask a lot more questions why I was doing them. Um, and was I doing them because this is what I really objectively wanted to do, or was I doing it just because this is what uh, everybody around me was telling me to do, um, and what everybody said was um, the safe, prestigious, uh, status-oriented track to, uh, to, to go down. Um, and I sort of describe myself as having had the sort of rolling quarter-life crisis during my 20s. Um, and at some point I decided that uh, it had sort of been a dead end and I needed to completely restart and uh, move back to California and uh, got involved in the tech boom in the late 90s and, and, uh, and sort of the rest, the rest is history. But I, I, think, um, I, think, I think we're all sort of strangely um, attracted to, uh, to competition in all these different ways. Uh, you know, the word ape, already at the time of Shakespeare meant both primate and to imitate. Um, and there is something about us that uh, makes us sort of extremely lemming-like. It's, 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 it's one of the, uh, it's one of the um, uh, shortcuts we have for often uh, figuring out uh, things, but it often, um, it often goes very badly wrong. Um, the, the sort of the cultural version of this that I, that I describe is that there is this very odd phenomenon in Silicon Valley where um, a lot of the really successful entrepreneurs seem to be suffering from a mild case of Asperger's or something like that. And, um, and I've, um, I, I think we need to sort of always turn this around and think of this as, a, as an indictment of our whole society. What does it tell you about a society where um, Asperger's is, is a beneficial trait? Because everybody who is a socially adapted will quickly, almost subconsciously, 
pick up on all these social cues and will be discouraged from thinking any of their original thoughts before they're even fully formed because they will realize that, they're, that the answers they have to my contrarian question, whether it's the intellectual one or the business one, they will, they will sense that the answers to that question are uncomfortable um, and shouldn't be pursued. And so they will uh, veer instead towards, um, towards these, uh, these hyper-competitive tracks that, um, that, uh, that people seem to be doubling down on with more and more intensity every year, even though the returns on them seem to be getting less and less. Uh, two, other, two other answers to the, the contrarian question. So one is the, one is the, um, the um, monopoly uh, competition one. Um, the, the, second, the second one that I, I always like to underscore is, you know, there's, there's sort of a, so if you took one step back and said, well, um, you have this question, tell me something that's true that very few people agree with you on. Um, you know, I just don't think there's anything like that at all. I think, you know, um, everything that people agree on is true and everything else is just ridiculous. Um, and I think that is actually a pretty widespread mindset of sorts. And I, I sort of, in my book, describe these three different categories of things. You can have conventional things, which everybody understands. Um, you have things that are mysteries, which nobody has a clue about. And then there's things that are in between, which I call secrets, which are things you could figure out, but it's hard to figure them out. Um, and we have, a, we have a bias as a society that there are, um, there are basically no secrets left. They've all been found. Um, and, uh, you know, it's sort of, it's probably in some ways it's linked to globalization, I think, where, you know, there's seven billion other people on this planet. And so you sort of think, um, well, there's nothing I can figure out because someone else will have already figured it out, or it's impossible to figure out. So, uh, so we, we sort of end up with this thinking where everything is either a convention or a, an imponderable mystery. There's nothing in between. And when you think that um, everything is a convention or a mystery, um, where everything can be understood by a 12-year-old or um, and an Einstein can't learn more than a 12-year-old, um, that ends up being, uh, being fairly demotivating. And, um, and it is true that there are some domains where you know, a lot of things have been figured out. You know, if, you're, if, you're, um, if you're set on becoming an explorer like people were in the 17th and 18th century, well, there are no empty spaces left on the map to go to. Um, and so that probably will be uh, an unsuccessful um, errand to find some new secrets. Or if you, um, or if you set out to discover a new element in the periodic table, um, that's probably also not a good idea for a place to look. Um, but I think, I think there are actually um, an enormous number of these things that do exist. There are sort of all these emerging fields, um, certainly a lot, of, lot in the computer area, but, but I think also in many other technologies where um, there is quite a lot that can be done. And the, um, and the, uh, the truth seems to be that the people who believe that there are secrets, who believe that there are things to discover, are the people who actually will look for them and will find them. And the people who think there are none, um, that everything's already been solved, uh, will, not even, will not even try. And, um, and I think that there is something like this idea that you have a secret that other people don't understand, you, you're working on a problem that other people are not working on, that uh, um, is really um, at the core of what drives many of these successful startups. Uh, you know, the, you know uh, as the uh, introducer mentioned, you know, um, we started PayPal with this, uh, with this new, new payment system, but it, um, um, you know, it sort of, we had all these ideas about how uh, with the advent of the internet, you could, ha you could complete, create a completely new currency, and if you changed money, you changed the whole world in all these sort of completely fundamental ways. And I think, you know, many people find payments kind of boring and not interesting, but we thought this was like, this was the key to, to world revolution and world change. Um, and it, it didn't, you know, it didn't quite succeed, but the, um, the, uh, the sort of, the, the focus that that gave you uh, enabled, uh, encouraged you to sort of push in ways that you, you would not have done so otherwise. Um, and my colleague Elon with, uh, with SpaceX, uh, you know, th their secret in a sense is that uh, it's possible to go to Mars and we need to, you know, we should become an interplanetary species. Um, you know, most people think that's crazy. Most people um, don't think it matters. But there are 
there's a subset of you know, very talented rocket scientists who actually thought this was really important. They became convinced that this, this was a cool thing to work on. And that was, that was the nucleus around which uh, the SpaceX business uh, got built. And I, th I think when one finds something like this that's understood um, implicitly by, by all these people, and it sort of goes very much against the, the conventional wisdom in our society, which is that, um, that, that everything's already been discovered, that um, you know, maybe, you can, um, maybe if you continue working in academia, you can get um, you know, a postdoc, and 10 years after your postdoc, you can work on some itsy-bitsy esoteric area. Um, and, um, and, and, um, and the reality, I think, is that there are much larger areas that are um, within uh, much closer reach that, for whatever reason, people are, um, are not quite exploring. Um, third, um, third contrarian thought for the, uh, for the evening um, is somewhat, uh, somewhat bigger picture, and um, sort of another um, way that I use the zero to one concept. Uh, I, I, I think that um, when we think about the uh, 21st century, there will be um, tremendous uh, progress in this century. And I think the two big drivers of progress will be globalization and technology. And I always describe these things as being on, um, on very different um, axes. I, I, I sort of uh, always like to draw it as an X and Y diagram with globalization is on the X axis and it involves copying things that work or going from one to N or horizontal growth. And I think of technology as doing new things, going from zero to one, intensive or vertical progress. And by just sort of putting them on different axes, I, I think it's a good uh, way to underscore how globalization and technology are very different kinds of things in our world. There's a way in which you can think of China as you know, a place where there's a lot, of, it's a lot of focus on globalization. California maybe is a place that's more focused on technology. And you have sort of very different kinds of things people do. Copying things works if you care about globalization. It doesn't work nearly as well for something um, like intensive technological progress. And if we sort of think about the, the history of the last 200 years, um, there have been periods of globalization, there have been periods of technology, um, and they, they sort of, you know, 1815 to 1914 was a period of, uh, where you had both tremendous globalization and tremendous technological progress. Um, 1914 to uh, uh, globalization went in reverse, trade went down, um, you know, parts of the world sort of seceded, got cut off uh, in one way or another. Technology continued to progress very, very quickly. Um, 1971, Kissinger uh, goes to China. Uh, the last four decades have been a period of um, an enormous reacceleration of globalization, and I would argue a somewhat a slower period of technological progress, an era in which there has been um, fast progress in computers, not so fast progress in anything else. Uh, I, I've often described it as a sort of two-track technological world in which we've had progress in the world of uh, bits, uh, much less progress in the world of atoms. Um, and so, um, so things like uh, solutions to the energy problem, um, transportation, uh, various areas of biomedicine, um, all sorts of areas like this have been much less promising areas to go in, in in the last four decades, which have been a period of intense globalization and more limited technological progress. And, and it's, it's, it's ref this sort of shift is reflected in the language we use to describe our world. Uh, it was, you know, it would have been, um, in the 50s or 60s, you would have divided the world into the first world and the third world. The first world was the part of the world that was progressing rapidly technologically. The third world was that part that was sort of permanently screwed up. Um, today, we would speak of the uh, developed and the developing worlds. Um, uh, the developing world is that part of the world which is copying the developed world and is converging with it. And so this is a pro-globalization, convergence theory of history dichotomy. But it is also implicitly an anti-technological dichotomy because when we say that we're living in the developed world, we are saying that we're living in that part of the world where nothing new is going to happen, where there's going to be stagnation, and where we can expect um, tomorrow to look uh, no different from today. And uh, I think we should be uh, pushing back a lot harder on that. We should not accept um, this notion that we live in the developed world, and we should be asking, once again, uh, the question of how can we develop 
the developed world. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to begin by thanking Peter for his time and for his insight. It means a lot to me, as it should to each of you, that Peter chose to spend this evening at Columbia University before the members of the next generation of entrepreneurs. I'm confident that the minds in this auditorium are chock full of ideas that will take us all from zero to one. I'm Keith Goggin. I'm a proud 1991 graduate of the Columbia Journalism School and an occasional entrepreneur of orders of magnitude less success than Peter. I'm here tonight to introduce my fellow J School alum, Shane Snow, but first I want to give you a quick update on one of the entrepreneurship initiatives at Columbia. Last night was the grand opening of the David and Helen Gurley Brown Institute for Media Innovation. The Brown Institute, as many of you know, is the legacy of two legendary media visionaries. David Brown brought us Jaws, The Sting, and Driving Miss Daisy. Helen Gurley Brown played a starring role in the women's movement and revolutionized the magazine industry as the longtime editor of Cosmopolitan. A portion of the fortune that David and Helen amassed funds the Brown Institute, a collaboration between Columbia's J School and the School of Engineering at Stanford University. The Brown Institute is charged with encouraging and supporting new endeavors in media innovation. And that's important because innovation is interdisciplinary, it is global, and it is collaborative. Within each school and across both universities, the reach of the Brown Institute is broad. Since inception, the Brown Institute has awarded 17 magic grants totaling $2 million to teams of students, faculty, alumni, and postdocs from the partner schools to facilitate the development of transformative media technologies. At last night's gala, Hearst Corporation CEO Frank Bennett called the Brown Institute the best example of what a great university does, and I wholeheartedly agree. Even this early, in the veritable dawn of its existence, the Brown Institute is playing a vital role in promoting entrepreneurship at Columbia. According to Chris McGarry, one of the directors of Columbia Entrepreneurship, some of the best entrepreneurial ideas university-wide are coming out of the J School and the Brown Institute. But I know you all want to get to the interview portion of tonight's program, so I'll get to the point. Shane Snow is a 2010 graduate of the Columbia Journalism School and an award-winning entrepreneur and journalist. He is the founder and chief creative officer of Contently, a technology company with the mission to create a better media world. Contently has helped more than 30,000 freelance journalists build better careers and provides publishing tools and creative talent for major Fortune 500 brands. His writing has appeared in Wired Magazine, The New Yorker, Fast Company, and Advertising Age, and he is the best-selling author of the new book, Smart Cuts, How Hackers, Innovators, and Icons Accelerate Success. Shane has been named one of Details Magazine's Digital Mavericks, one of Forbes' 30 Under 30 Media Innovators, a fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts, and a member of LinkedIn's exclusive influencer program. More importantly, Shane has been named a Brown Institute Fellow and will be teaching a seminar on journalism and entrepreneurship at the Institute. Please welcome tonight's interviewer, Shane Snow. All right. Well, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you and Blake on writing a remarkable book. I, uh, so I have at my nightstand about a half dozen business books at any time that are left half read because most business books should be about half the size that they are. And uh, by the time I got done with this, it looked like my other business books had taken it outside and beaten the crap out of it. Uh, and uh, I took tons of notes. I felt like I took a, one of your courses after, after reading this. So congratulations on, on writing a great book. Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to start with an easy question, and we'll get to some hard questions. You're a digital pioneer. Uh, you build billion-dollar companies. Uh, why write a book? Why, why write something on dead trees uh, as someone who changes uh, industries and changes the world? Well, it's... Um... We, 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 it was sort of a system of elimination. We couldn't find, we couldn't yet figure out a better format to do this in. We had, you know, we, uh, I taught this class at Stanford. Blake uh, took these notes in the class. He posted them on the internet. They sort of went viral. We got tons of people to read them. And then there was a question, what do you do, what do you do next? And we thought of uh, doing sort of like a video version of it, but I don't, I don't think people actually want to watch videos because they're about a third as fast as reading. I'd much rather just read something. And then, um, and then maybe you could do it 
as a blog, but we wanted to be really, we wanted to get everything exactly right. And then if you're gonna get it exactly right, you might as well do, a, do it as a book. Uh, we initially thought of uh, self-publishing the book and doing it all ourselves and figuring out you know, some internet distribution channels. But, um, but then, uh, you know, we, we, at the end we sort of became convinced it was still best to go with a, uh, a big publisher. You get the imprimatur. imprimatur and may, there'd be all these sort of subtle things that might go wrong if you self-publish. So we well, somehow, think, it was a system of elimination, we ended up with that as the idea. Well, I think there's a lot of people, you're speaking to an audience, ideally, who, uh, who needs to get on board with the future, and, and, uh, and we read print books, so, uh, so there's something there. So you, you write that, and you spoke to this, that monopoly is the condition of every successful business. So when I read that, I say, well, what about Coke and Pepsi? What about Adidas and Nike, Unilever and Procter and Gamble? Uh, how do you, uh, you're, you're anti-competition, it sounds right. like. Uh, how do you explain these, these companies that appear to be competitors and not monopolies? Well, I, I, would, um, I think they're successful because they're less competitive than they look. You know, I think, uh, I think these brands are quite powerful. Um, most people have a preference for either Coke or Pepsi. Um, there aren't that many people who are completely indifferent to whether they have Coke or Pepsi. And because people are not indifferent to it, um, you're, able to, um, you're able to get away with, with a fair bit of uh, pricing power. Bra branding is one of the forms Monopoly uh, takes. Um, it's one that uh, I generally don't invest in because I don't feel I understand how you uh, bring it about. But, uh, but it is the somewhat mysterious thing that, that does happen, and when it happens, it's very powerful. So, so Coke has a monopoly on people who love Coke, is, is what you're saying? The, the market is, is effectively kind of divided between the two of them. Otherwise, the pricing would be much cheaper. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about competition, uh, and you say, you know, so Google has this monopoly on the search industry. I think there's a lot of folks out here who are working on building companies that, that they realize, and so in my company, we have competitors, and it feels like once you have a good idea, the competition comes out of the woodwork. And even Google, who now enjoys a monopoly, had very stiff competition in the early days. So how do you, I guess, how do you approach sort of the, the building of a monopoly in, in your definition when the reality is there is competition, that you often can't do anything about it existing? Well, um, well it depends a lot on, on the different dynamics within the markets, but ideally, uh, Ideally, um, you either have a technological advantage that's big enough that people can't easily replicate it. So that's always, so we, we often like companies where there's some, um, some real technical talent or some, there's some actually pretty hard problem because that means people cannot simply copy it. Um, or you have some um, distribution or marketing strategy where it scales very quickly or, um, and somehow people uh, can't replicate this. Uh, but um, but the, the model I like is uh, that you start with um, one, one other sort of contrarian insight from the, uh, from the monopoly perspective that leads me to a very different way of thinking about things is um, the convention is always that you should look at big markets. You should go after big markets. Market size is an important thing. And um, I always like small markets because, um, you know, the, the way you, you know, if you're a startup, you start small. And a monopoly, you have a large share of the market. So how do you get to monopoly as a startup quickly? Um, you start with a small market. And you then get to take over that market really fast. Facebook started with 10,000 people at Harvard. And it went from 0 to 60% market share in 10 days. And that was, that was a very promising start. And then that could be replicated at other colleges. And, uh, and then there were people who tried to copy it sort of a year later, two years later. But by then, it had gotten a lot of traction, and um, it was somehow very hard to, to catch up. Um, so investors don't like to, you know this, they don't like to invest in small markets, right? So as an entrepreneur, how do you balance that? You have to paint this big vision, tell a huge story with, with this reality. Or you have to show some initial traction. But yeah, I, th I, think, uh, I think there was a, there was a I mean, there, there was certainly a bizarre um, Facebook prehistory where um, you know, uh, they started the company in February. I didn't get to invest in it till summer of 2004. And uh, it is a very mysterious question still why the various investors in Boston did not give them any money. And so I, I, I think investors systematically make this sort of mistake where um, if you have something that has intense traction on a small market, people will often, um, often not like it. So there's, there's a very interesting question why, uh, why people in Boston all made all made that mistake early on with, uh, with, uh, with Facebook, and uh, why, as a result, I was able to invest. 
Um, Tell us about that, that first meeting with Mark. I mean, we, see, we, we watched the movie, but we missed the part with, uh, you know, I think there's just you handing a check or something, right? Uh, how well, did that meeting, and uh, what, was he dressed like a slob? You know, like, uh, the people, people, ask, people ask this question all the time. And there's actually nothing that interesting I have to say about it. You know, it was, uh, he, was, uh, he was very introverted. He's still kind of introverted, but he was very introverted. He didn't say very much. Uh, Sean Parker, who was played by um, um, Justin he. Timberlake uh, in, the, in the movie, uh, um, did, did a little bit more of the talking. Um, and, uh, but it, they had gotten a lot of traction. We'd done our homework on the company and we, we gave them the half million dollar check at the end of the meeting so that they would take it from us and not from somebody else. One of the things that I like to write about is how momentum or perceived momentum can be a stronger indicator of future success than sort of absolute success. Is that what you saw in Facebook that others didn't? There, the, the, there's always, um, as an investor, there's always also a contrarian, you know, the, the contrarian question for an investor is, um, what great investments is nobody making? Or, and, 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 and it's always like, why is this a good company? And then why is there a blind spot where people are, are um, missing it? And I think, you know, so I think it was a great company because it was growing really fast. The only thing they needed money for was to buy more computers to meet the, um, the incredible demand they had at other colleges to launch. The, um, the, the reason why, there was, I think, several reasons people were missing it. Um, there's probably always still a degree to which people underestimate exponential growth. Sort of the classic Einstein line that uh, he's apocryphally said to have said that exponential growth is the most compound interest, the most powerful force in the universe. Mm -hmm. So you have something that's compounding exponentially that's, uh, that's very powerful and tends to get underestimated. Um, I think the fact that it was a college site um, made people underestimate it because um, Investors often like to invest in things they themselves use or understand, and since very few investors were going to college, I think they had a systematic blind spot there. So I think it's always worth asking why you have blind spots like this. Um, and I think Facebook was probably very undervalued the first two and a half years. Um, they opened the site up in late 06, um, and the early, the mid 06 valuation was 550 million, the mid 07 one was 15 billion, and that, that was probably that was probably a full valuation when Microsoft came in. So uh, I, I was reading the book, and uh, you'll notice that I'm wearing a startup t-shirt tonight, because I read the line in the book where you said that you won't consider a company, a founder who walks into your office and isn't wearing a startup t-shirt, something to that effect. And it's, it's first like of all, this I, telephone game, it all gets slightly changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> something to that effect. First of all, I want to ask why you're not wearing a, a Palantir shirt tonight. Well, um, well I'm... Um, you know, I, th I think there are no hard and fast sartorial rules, but uh, it's um, it's always um, you know I think if you're um, if you're if you're trying to promote a book in New York City, uh, you want to sort of look like an author, and that's that's what I'm trying to look like tonight. It's, it's working. Um, yeah. I think that uh, I think that uh, if you are um, if you're pitching a startup in Silicon Valley, if you wear a suit, um, it looks like you're bad at sales and worse at tech. So that's that's a bad combination. Yeah. Well, so on that note, you talk about uh, almost how a, a great startup in the early days is almost like a cult. Uh, I have a friend who's one of the early employees at, at Facebook uh, who he listed out his life's priorities in a blog post, and it was Facebook, myself, my family. And that was, that was his list of priorities, that he would take a bullet for Facebook before like, his own you know, right. brother. Uh, so you talk about this, this idea of building a cult at a startup, and I think the, the PayPal mafia you know, everyone talks about the places where all of these, all of these guys gone and have gone and the companies they've built. When you built that team, what were you looking for? What did you see? How did you curate that group? And, and what did you go through together to get to the point where these people could all go on and, and build successful companies? Well, it's, um, you know, it's, it's not quite a cult and you don't quite want to have a mafia either. So these are, you know, but, 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 but I, I, think, I think you do... Um, I do think there's always this question of the uh, intensity of, um, of, of these businesses. The, uh, the thing that, um, the normal failure mode in uh, startups is, um, you know, it's way before the external competitors destroy you. Uh, the, nor the standard failure mode is internal. It's the people don't get along. Um, and, um, and, uh, and basically, um, and so, you know, one, one of the questions I've often found to be a very good one to to ask people is to ask, you know, what's the prehistory? When did they meet? You know, if, 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 oh, we just met at a networking conference a week ago and we both uh, like 
becoming entrepreneurs, and so we decided to join up and start a company. Um, that sounds like, okay, we, I got married to the first person I met at the slot machines in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you might hit the jackpot, but it's, uh, it's probably a really bad idea. And, um, and, um, and the good answer is more like there's a long prehistory, and we've been thinking about this for a long time. And so I, I do think there is sort of an intensity that um, when it is there is really powerful. And um, when, it's, um, you know, it's, when it's missing, you, you have sort of this um, you know, manic depressive aspect to these startups where um, you know, it's like you're going to take over the world or you're all going to get destroyed and you go from one extreme to the other several times a day. And, um, and if, if you don't have things working well internally, um, the companies tend to blow up. So I, I, uh, I use this analogy a lot when I talk uh, to other entrepreneurs that are starting companies that you wouldn't start a rock band with four guitarists. And that's a lot of times what people do, especially in business school. They get their four business buddies uh, with MBAs and they go start a company. Uh, you came from law. You grabbed Reed from Poli Sci or something and several dudes from various Soviet countries. And uh, <laughs> you, you assembled this, this team that was a fairly motley crew. What, what about these people made, the, made what you, you made so special? Well, we, um, there, was, there was a longer history. So, so um, Reed joined a little bit later, but you know, there, was a, there was a group of us that were friends from Stanford. There was a group of us that were friends from um, uh, uh, University of Illinois. Um, uh, and we, there was sort of a way in which we had known each other for some time before we, before we teamed up. Um, there was, uh, you know, we were... Um, I don't know, you know, we like, I don't know, it was, it, it was very focused on, um, on, on, um, on getting a, um, you know, and then, and then you, do, you do sort of form a team. The, the question, you know, the, when, I, when I worked in a big law firm in a big bank in New York, um, one of the, you know, one of the dynamics I always disliked was that um, all the people that you were really competing against were the people right next to you. And so um, there were sort of no, friend, no fundamentally friendly people around. All the people around were structurally hostile. You, know, you start a law firm, there are 80 people um, coming in, five will make partner after eight years, and um, it's you against all of, um, all of the, the people who you're sort of interchangeable with, and banks are very similar to that. And, um, and the, uh, the, the goal that, uh, that uh, Max and I had when we started PayPal was we wanted to create a company where um, there would be some incredibly uh, strong friendships that would be formed. Um, and uh, you know, we, th we thought that, uh, and so the question was, and, and so we sort of, and, and so the question was, um, you know, we didn't hire only our friends, but it was, could we be friends with these people? And, uh, and that, that turned out to be a, that turned out to be a, um, a, a sort of, and, and this is sort of where it's beyond, it's what I describe as something, you want to always move beyond professionalism. You don't want to be, you know, sort of a law firm I remember interviewing with, uh, one of the partners told me um, all, the, it was, all the partners hated one another and they still made a lot of money because it was such a professional place. And, um, and I think you want to have something that's more than just professional. That's, yeah, um, okay. Well, so, I mean, at, at Contently, we, this strange phenomenon I have, we're about 65 people now and I've noticed that our employees get up and leave on Friday afternoons and go to the bar together without me. And, uh, and it's a strange feeling, but it's kind of, you feel almost like a proud parent, like, hey, they, they love each other, even though, you know, that we're just paying their salaries. And uh, so there's something, there's something nice to that yeah, idea. One of, one, of the, one of the rules I, um, one of the sort of rules I heard, which I haven't checked whether it's true, but sounded plausible, was that uh, if you have three really good friends at the company you're working at, uh, you're likely to stay there indefinitely. If you have zero really good friends at the company you're working at, you're at a very high risk of turnover. Yeah. So I, I do think these things are very underexplored. So here's a hard question. Uh, Star Trek or Star Wars? Oh, uh, that's, that's easy. Uh, Star Wars. No question. <laughs> I, it's like, like you know, um, well, we, we, we had... Um, you talk about this in, in the book, actually. Well, we had, uh, we had uh, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're starting a payments company like PayPal, um, you have, you know, Star Wars. The whole plot line is about um, Han Solo trying to get the money to uh, to pay off, uh, you know, to pay off some of the debts he has. So it's about the money thing is like an essential plot element. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Star Trek, you have the uh, you have the transporter device um, that can transform uh, anything into anything, 
And so it's a world where there is um, um, seemingly no scarcity and no money. And it's only mentally deranged people in the Star Trek universe who want to have money. So, um, so uh, you know, that's. And, and it's Star, Star Wars is a very competitive environment, right? So that. Well, it's, um, it's you know, I, you, you have to be careful not to push the analogies too far. <laughs> we, we can move on, okay. So you, you talk a surprising amount in the book about uh, political issues. Uh, for a business book, uh, I found a surprising amount. So I've had this dream for a while, ever since I saw a news report of a guy that built a floating island out of uh, water bottles off the coast of Cancun and floated away and no one heard from him again. I've had this dream of building a floating city. And I've heard that you've harbored similar, uh, similar ideas. So the question is, if you had a floating city and you could start a government anew, what would you do with that government starting fresh that you couldn't be able to do now, say, in Silicon Valley? Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's almost like, what, what, are, what are you allowed to do? I don't know. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think that, um, I, 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 do, I do think the, uh, the seasteading, floating city project, uh, uh, it was, uh, I was friends with Milton Friedman. It came to me from his uh, grandson, uh, Patrick Friedman. Um, and it was sort of the small side project we, we got involved with over the, over the years that uh, has generated, always generates like an almost embarrassing amount of, uh, of, of intensity, uh, of interest. And I, I think it gets a lot of interest because there's a sense that there's no frontier left. There's no place that you can go. Um, every uh, part of the, this planet's uh, surface is... Um, uh, of land surfaces covered with by political entities of one sort or another, um, and um, you know, outer space is probably still a little bit too far away for the time being. Um, and so, even though the sea setting thing is, is sort of a somewhat far-fetched uh, uh, project, it uh, it captures a lot of uh, gets a lot of discussion going because there is there is this sense that um, that we're living in a um, more ossified, more bureaucratic society where there are. A uh, lot of rules, and there are a lot of things you can't do. And I, I think the, you know, the, the big, the, probably the one, you know, the, the 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 political issue that I'm always the most concerned about, is um, is whether um, um, we are having uh, enough technological innovation as a society. Um, I think that in many areas, um, uh, there are way too many restrictions that uh, stop us from innovating quickly. Um, the world of bits of computers is mostly unregulated. The world of atoms is, is heavily regulated. Uh, you know, if you got the polio vaccine today, you would not be able to get it approved. Um, and, um, and so I think, I, I think that there are a lot of, um, a lot of biomedical areas where, um, where I think uh, we're doing much less well than, than we could be. Do you think perhaps a, a floating island where there'd be more medical experimentation allowed? I think there would be way more allowed, yes. yes. Um, so speaking of space, in the, the last chapter, of, so I was tickled when I, I came to the part in your book about uh, 10x thinking, because the last chapter of my book is actually called 10x thinking. And it's the story of, uh, of Elon Musk at SpaceX when they nearly lost the company. And uh, basically the story goes that they, uh, Elon at some point told his employees, I have enough money for three rockets. Two rockets failed, the third rocket failed, and everyone kind of panicked, and then he, surprised, uh, had uh, obtained an investment from someone, uh, a benefactor or a, a, an investor that, uh, that saved the company. And now they're, they were the first private space company to uh, reach orbit. They're you know, reducing the cost to, to go to space by orders of magnitude. Um, tell us about being on the other side of, that's a crazy vision. Elon says he wants to die on Mars. Being on, and, and you knew him. Uh, but being on the other side of that as an investor, tell us about that story of the calculus that you had uh, looking at that scenario. Well, it was, um, it was we, we invested in SpaceX uh, in uh, summer of 2008, um, and uh, they had, the two rockets had blown up. Um, it, was, it was a very contrarian investment because um, nobody was investing in rocket companies. Uh, there were, in fact, um, you know, there was, no one had any expertise in investing in rocket companies. There had been no rocket companies started in 40 years or so of any, of any significance. And, um, and so... Um, so it was definitely very far um, outside the, uh, the fashionable zone. Uh, but then when you actually looked at the business, um, the, the fundamentals of the business are quite good. It was, it was one where um, you got paid in advance for your rocket, so it actually 
generates positive cash flow very quickly. Uh, uh, they had actually quite a bit more runway than just one rocket, so they had, um, you know, they'd, they'd gotten, you know, there was this guy in DARPA who uh, really liked Elon, and um, even though DARPA was not allowed to uh, fund uh, research into rockets, he just ordered rockets one after another, and then if it failed, he just bought another rocket. Uh, he wasn't funding the research. Um, and so, uh, so th there was, you know, we thought there was, they had, more, they had probably four or five tries left at that point. Um, the press story was that they're crazy, but behind the scenes, it was actually a very good business, you're saying. Um, it was, you know, once we looked at it carefully, it was, it was a much better business than, we, than even we had thought. And uh, um, certainly, uh, we got, I, you know, we had a, a, a few of our LPs, um, um, LPs who had not invested in Founders Fund, voluntarily wrote us and told us that this was the dumbest investment they had ever seen. And if you know how risk-averse the uh, limited partners who tend to run these fund to funds that invest in these uh, venture funds are, um, for them to voluntarily say that it's a dumb idea, um, they have to be convinced it's a just an unbelievably stupid idea. Which for an investor like you might, must be music to your ears. It's, uh, no, it's, it's, not, it's always, you want to be contrarian and right. It's yeah, most of yeah, the time, okay. most of the time, you know, Look, look, look I, I believe one plus one equals two. I believe the earth goes around the sun. Most things, I think, most conventional truths are just true. So the, uh, speaking of math, uh, the 10x thinking thing I think is real interesting. Uh, Astro Teller of Google X says that it's easier to build a business that's 10 times bigger than just 10%, or 10 times better than 10% better. Uh, and you talk about how if you want to obtain a monopoly, you should do something that's 10 times better than just two times better. But the question that when I tell entrepreneurs this, uh, people get excited, very excited about this idea, but the question always is how? How do you do something 10 times better than what everyone else is struggling to improve on? Well, it has to be, um, it has to be in some, on some relevant metrics. So, uh, so for example, um, you could say, um, and it's, it's sort of a rule of thumb, but, but the intuition is that if it's 20%, 30% better, um, it's, it's not enough to really convince people to change their behavior. Because um, you know, you're always, it's always technology plus the sale of technology. And the sale of technology, um, you know, people, people don't like change. Um, change is, polls very, very poorly in our society. And so, um, and, so, uh, and so to actually induce people to change what they're doing, it has to be something that just feels dramatically different, dramatically better. Um, you know, I would say Amazon, you know, it was when Amazon started as an online book, um, bookseller, they had more than 10 times as many books available as any bookstore in the U.S. That's sort of like a, it's a sort of banal version of it, but it's, you just have sort of 10 times in, in terms of diversity. Um, you know, PayPal, when we started, you could say that, uh, you could say that uh, the alternative was writing checks on eBay, which took seven to 10 days to cash versus getting the money, um, getting the money within, you know, instantaneously or within, you know, a few hours. Um, and, uh, and so I think there are sort of all these different ways things, things do. I think, you know, an innovation like the iPhone, you know, where maybe it was just like, a, you define an iPhone as a smartphone that just works. Um, that's, uh, that's like maybe infinitely times better since right. well, there's nothing at all. Hundreds of thousands of apps that you can right. add onto it. So they're flagging this down on time, but I have one more question. Uh, from a student. So we had students uh, come up with some questions and, uh, and picked a couple, but the one that I wanted to ask you is, uh, speaking of Elon Musk, says Elon Musk decided in college that he wanted to change three industries uh, that were important problems, the internet, space, and energy. And uh, so the question for you is, if you were sitting in one of these seats and about to exit college and going to start a company, what industry would you want to change? What problem would you work on? You know, I, I, um, I, 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 I'm going to resist answering it on, on quite that level because I, I think it's, I, I never like thematic answers uh, where it's industries or sectors because when they're that big, um, there's uh, too much going on in it. So, uh, so you know, I do, I do think there are, I'd, I'd like us to be working a lot more on the energy side. I'd like us to be working a lot more on, um, on, um, on you know, biomedical research of, of in, in various ways, but uh, but it's you, I want I always like to push back against framing it that abstractly. The uh, 
You know, the, the, the great companies always have a certain particularity to them where the problem is almost the same size. You know, there's, there's a search problem, but search is really Google. Or there's a, you know, um, social networking in some sense is, is coeval with Facebook. I mean, there's some other social networking companies at this point, but, but, um, but uh, it's, uh, it's often a mistake to think of it on that level, whereas, um, and so, you know, the, 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 the problems people often talk about today that I'm um, perhaps the most skeptical, where it's most often framed in this abstract way, are um, education and healthcare IT, where, um, and, you know, where I think, you know, I think people broadly agree there's a lot that's somewhat off and, and you have ideas about how to fix it. But, uh, but if you frame it um, as an education startup or healthcare IT startup, um, that's, that's slightly too abstract. And it's always, it's always sort of a much more, much more granular, much more, uh, much more specific, uh, specific kind of a framing. Uh, you know, the, the, the area that I'm, I'm most uh, passionate about um, as, a, as an area of sort of both of science and, and, and then shading into uh, technology is, um, is the uh, question of whether we can do things to, to work on longevity. You know, one out of, uh, you know, um, almost all diseases people suffer from are linked to aging. At age 30, you have a one in a thousand chance of uh, getting cancer in your next year. Uh, at age 80, you have a one in 10 chance. Um, and, um, and so I, I, do, I do think we could be doing a lot more on studying aging, understanding why it happens, understanding the causes, slowing it down, uh, and, uh, and possibly uh, reversing it. And, um, and, and so, but that's again sort of maybe too broad a theme, even though it's something I'm very passionate about. Maybe someone in this audience will take a very small piece of that, build a monopoly, read the book, and then and then Even a small piece of that would be worth a lot. Yeah. Well, thank you, Peter. This has been fantastic. And again, awesome. congratulations. Thank on the you book. very much. Thanks so much to Shane and Peter. Thanks, Thanks a lot. round of applause.